one. The first one is Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. And the next one is um, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. Okay? It's two passages. Matthew chapter 10, 5 and 6. Matthew um, 28, 18 to 19. So we read the first one and then we read the second one. I want you to think through them. And here's what I want you to discover from these verses. The question I want you to, I am, I'm asking is, what are the differences between these two passages? What are the differences between these two passages? Let's read first Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6, and then we will go to Matthew 28. You have it? Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. Let's read together. Everybody reading together. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into my Okay, just read a little again, one more time, a little more energy, a little more energy and a little more clarity. I know the British people will read very clearly, so let's go again. These Jesus sent and them go not into the way of the Gentiles and into the kingdom of the Samaritans Brilliant. Okay, lovely. So hold, hold on to hold on to that verse. Think about it for a moment. Now let's go to Matthew ch chapter 28, verses 18 and 19, and let's read it. A well-known passage, but I want you to read it with new understanding. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. What it says. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, lovely. Excellent. Think about it for a moment. Now the question is, what are the differences between these two passages? What are the differences between these two passages? Think about it first, silently. Reflect what are the differences between these two passages. Okay, excellent. Very good. Now share with the person next to you. What you discover is what, what you discover are the differences between these two passages. Share with the person what you discover. What did you see as the differences between these passages? Thank you. One person, just stand and tell me what you discover, what you see, uh, what you perceive as the differences between the two passages. Just one person. Anybody? Yeah? The first one is to the Israel, travel Israel mm -hmm. The second one is to the Okay, brilliant, excellent. One is particular, the other one is universal. Okay? But when Jesus began where? With the universal first or he began with the particular? He began first with the particular. And he began with the lost sheep where? Lost sheep in Israel. Okay, the lost sheep in Israel, you can, you can, you can give them different definition. But in this context, we're saying the lost sheep in Israel represent all the former members who drifted yes. away from the church. Yes. Go to the lost sheep first. Yes and then engage in the universal. But if you, if you load it in the history of Matthew, Matthew was a Jew, and he was writing specifically to the Jewish people who became Christian, Jewish Christians, and they, and they had doubts about whether Jesus was the Messiah. And so his, the aim of the entire book was to convince his readers that Jesus indeed is the Messiah. So he began speaking about everything that is Jewish, Jewish history. If you look at the gene gene genealogy, it's all about he began from Abraham and he's coming right now. But notice in the genealogy, he included Rahab. Yes. Yes. He included Ruth. Yes. 
and the indication here that Matthew ended the book by saying that God's mission is not only particular, but his mission is universal. Are you with me? Very important point here. So that, um, but God is not neglecting the lost sheep. He's not neglecting the lost sheep in Israel. They're very, very important. So it's impo in other words, God is arguing there are sheep who are lost in Israel. Lost in church, amazing yet true. Okay, excellent. I want to give you one more exercise with the same passage, but this time with Matthew 28, 28, 18, and 19. And I, you're ready to ready. What is the what is the key word there? What is the key word in there? Let's read it again, and then I want to ask what is the key word? Matthew 28, verse Matthew 28, 18 and 19. Let's read together, everybody. Let's read. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. Think for it for a moment. Think for I'm not I'm not I'm not lecturing, I'm engaging you in learning process, okay? What is the key word there? Power. Huh? Power. Okay. Anybody else? What's the key word? Go. Uh-huh. What else? Teach. All nations. The key word? Teach. Baptize. Okay, brilliant. Okay, lovely. Okay, so we have many good answers. The key words. In, in, in the passage, and um, let's look at it, the keyword in the passage. Let's look at the keyword. So you see, I'm teaching inductively. I'm helping you to discover, learning. Okay, it's inductive teaching. Here is the keyword. That's the keyword here. Jesus did not die for baptizing. That's an activity. Jesus did not die for going. That's an activity. Jesus did not die for teaching. These are activities. But this, these are people. Amen? The key word in the passage there really is to make disciples of active members, of new members, of former members, and of those who have never accepted Christ. So what the passage is really saying here is this, as you, as, you, as, you, as you teach, make disciples. As you go, make disciples. As you baptize, make disciples. Why? Why are you making disciples? To bring them into the, the likeness of Christ, into full maturity, amen? amen? That's the goal. That's why the church exists. It, the church exists to, to bring people into full maturity, you know, like like in like in, 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 in Africa and in around the world, with a, a bunch of banana, a bunch of planting, you bring it into full maturity, you know that? A mango, a julie mango, a breadfruit, whatever, full maturity. And so, this is the goal of the church. All the Sabbath school ministry, the teaching ministry of the Sabbath school, the personal ministry, okay, the women's ministry, all of the ministry, TMI, the whole goal of TMI is this. Not on this, is as we baptize, we make disciples. As we teach, we make disciples. So we have to focus on making disciples. What, what kind of disciples do we make? Disciples who are matured in Christ, disciples who are ready for the coming of Jesus. When I look at this congregation, I see many elderly members. And one of the job of the church is to ensure that all of these elderly members are ready now, not tomorrow, but they're ready now for the coming of Jesus. So if they should die at any time, they are ready. The goal of making disciples is to, is to, is to help people to be ready for the coming of Jesus. That's the important thing. We must not be afraid of that, of preparing them for the coming of Jesus. So look at you, look at Paul's example. Paul's example is a clear example here of how Paul went about making disciples. In this passage, you can see there is evangelism, then there is making disciples, then there is the caring for the new members, then there is the, the trusting in the Holy Spirit, all of that. This is a very important passage you need to keep in mind to read every Sabbath. 
this gives you the model of how we go about making disciples. You notice they preach the gospel in the city of London and one large number of disciples. Then they return to Leicester and to Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain what? Faithful. So there, there, there was the baptism, there was the evangelism, but then the church returned to strengthen the new members. Amen? Amen. And to reclaim the missing members. All of that was important. So, okay, so here are some keywords you get from this passage. Notice that. Keywords, very, very important component of, con of conversion, holistic conversion. You had here the socialization, uh, you read in, you had Christology, Christ was the center, you had making of disciples, you had the role of the Holy Spirit, you had evangelism, you had church planting, you had making disciples, you had inductive Bible study. There was an important feature of the verses I just showed you of helping the church to grow. Okay. If you notice here, in making disciples, the key word here is love. He who beholds the Savior's matchless love will be elevated in thought, purifying heart, transforming character, and will go forth to be a light to the world. I don't know if you understand this. But when it comes to making disciples, it does not begin with the head. It begins with the heart. You watch this text, you see what it's saying? He who beholds the love of God. So God's love must be centered. This is why the church, the Sabbath school especially, must be, must be a community of grace. It must be a place where people feel safe, where all of the members feel a sense of belonging, a sense of acceptance. The Sabbath school must be a place when you come, there's great welcoming. When I came to Sabbath school this morning, there was people at the door welcoming. That's good. You, know, you, you also it can extend the welcome to the car park if it's not so cold. That you welcome them from the time they arrive in the car park, you, you welcome them to, 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 the, to the church. There must be, in, in, in the Sabbath school, there must be participation, involve everybody. Persons with special needs must not, never be left out in the Sabbath school. Involve them, the deaf, the blind, if whatever needs. In every Sabbath, involve somebody with a special needs in the Sabbath school so that everybody feel accepted everybody feels a sense of love now look at this look at how powerful love is if your daughter has a problem she has a boyfriend she, you're sending her to school she has a boyfriend who's another seven Adventist and you want to counsel her you want her to to, to to desist from that particular activity or relationship but if you say to her you know it's wrong the Bible says it is wrong you must not be unequally yoked. Break up that relationship. She might hardly listen to you because you only speak into her head. And because we are, we are all British people, we like to begin with the head first. We're strong with that, you know, especially in the British. We West Indians, we British people, we begin with the head first. But really, Jesus all, never begins with the head, he begins with the heart. So watch what, what's the difference you would make. Watch, I'm going to illustrate. If you would go to her and you say, listen to her. Daughter, do you know that when you were born, you almost died in childbirth? Daughter, do you know six months after you were born, we were traveling to see grandma and we had a vehicular accident. Three persons died, only you and I were saved. Daughter, do you know? That when you were 12 years old, you had typhoid fever and you were 12 days unconscious and you almost died, but God saved your life? Where am I speaking to? Where am I speaking to? Where am I addressing? The heart. After I've addressed the heart, the mind opens up like this. And the, heart, the mind is ready to, ask, to, to reason with me and to understand what I'm trying to say about be not unequally yoked. Always begin with the heart. Your husband has another lady and is drifting and you begin to condemn him and criticize him, but you may never reach him. But if you say to him, John, when you were sick, I was right beside the bedside. I slept every night there with you at the, bed, at the hospital. John, when you were not working, I was right there providing, there was no problem. I worked all day, all week. There was no problem, I provided the money. 
I was there. John. When you had this vehicle accident, you almost died. I prayed for you and I provided the best doctor and God saved you. Then you talk to him about the strange relationship. You're able to get it. That's what Ellen G. White is saying. He who beholds the matchless love of God will be elevated in thought, purifying her, and transform in character. And that's why Dr. Sudi made a very important text yes, this morning, but you probably didn't pay attention to it. Jesus says, if I be lifted up from the earth, you know what it means? If I be, what will you say? If I be lifted up, what he's talking about? If my love is lifted up from the earth, if you be, you allow people to see my love. I was wounded. I died that you might live. I was homeless that you might have mansion. I died that you might have eternal life. If my love is lifted up from the earth, sinners will be drawn to my love. When they are drawn to my love, then I will have access to their minds. Are, are you seeing the principles? Yes. Why is that so? Let me explain it. I want you to see those concepts first. No matter how sinful a person is, no matter whether he's a Chinese, Muslim, Buddhist, whatever he is, an atheist, agnostic, whatever he is, in every person, God has placed his image. Yes. Yes. Sin cannot erase it. No matter how vile or sinful he is, it is there in him. And so, when Jesus, the creator, is lifted up before the creature, when he, this, Jesus is lifted up before the creature, the, the love of God connects with that piece of magnet in the person. The, the, the God's image is like a piece of magnet. So when the love of God is lifted to, towards the sinner, the, the love of God connects with the magnet in, within that person, deep in his conscience, and he's drawn to his creator. Amen? Yeah. Amen? So I'm saying to you today, in the Sabbath school, in the AY services, in all of your program, present the love of God. In the song service, lift up the love of Jesus. And it is the love of God that will draw the sinners unto him. Amen. This is a very important concept. In dealing with your children, in dealing with wayward people, wayward members, the love of God is critical to that. So let's look at this. In the whole work of discipleship, Reclaiming missing members. This initiative of reclaiming missing members is an initiative of God. Reconciliation is an initiative of God. God takes the initiative to search for missing members. Do you agree? Yes. It's not an initiative of the conference or the general conference or the division or your church. It is God who takes the initiative. You have, you have many references of that in Luke chapter 15. Jesus goes in search of the loss of the lost sheep. The woman goes in search of the lost coin and so forth and, and, and the prodigal son, the father is looking for him. It is always God who takes the initiative for missing members. So it's an initiative of God. Why is that important? It's important because Ellen G. White says, every impulse to do the right things come from God. It is God who gives us the impulse to turn. It's the God who gives us the impulse to repent. So that's an initiative from God. Ellen G. White also goes on to say, nobody repents by himself. It, it is God who gives you the initiative to respond. So let's look at this. What is the message? The message is to be reconciled unto God who made us, to be restored unto him. So there is a unique message of reconciliation, to be restored unto him. This is the message. You're calling people who have strayed away to return unto God because God has been good to them. We'll illustrate that in a little later. It's a message of grace, a message of forgiveness. We are the ambassadors. He chose us to be his ambassadors. Who are the former members? Before I, get, I mention that, who are the former members? So look at the three things. One, God takes the initiative. Two, God gives us the message. Three, God gives us the ministry. So everything in the rec reclaiming of missing members comes from God. He takes the initiative. He tells us what to say. And he gives us the ministry of reconciliation. All of it comes from God. How many of you would like to receive these three things from God? Raise your hands. Lovely. So he, he takes the initiative. He gives us the message. 
And so, who are the former members? The former members are persons who have drifted from the church. Each have different stories. Jesus invites us to co collaborate with him to reconcile the former members to, unto himself. Teach, to teach us to, the question, which one of you have been one, uh, 100 sheep does not leave the 90 and 9 and go to find the, the, the one lost sheep? Who are the former members? There are people who have left the church for a long time. We consider a former member to be somebody who left the church for more, for more than two years, two years, ten years or more who have left the church. And many of them who have left the church, many of them who have left the church, they have left the church for two reasons. There are two reasons why lots of people have left the church, two main reasons. One is doctrinal reason and the other one is emotional reason. Which one do you think is the most? Or the highest. Which, which reason you think people have left the church? Or which is the dominant reason you think most of us have left the church? Is it doctrinal or emotional? Yes. Many of the people who have left the church, they have left the church because of emotional issues. Because of criticism from the members or things that we have done to them, things that we have said about them, and they have been hurt, they have been bruised, they have been battered. Emotional reasons. Some have left for doctrinal reasons, but the research shows that most of the people who have left is because of emotional reasons, because of they are, they, are, they are affected right here. Look at this. Watch one point. They are affected right here. And I told you already that Jesus says if you want to reach them, and if you want to reach anybody, you must begin here. And so they, they have left the church because of here, and so we must, we must contact them from here. Are you with me? Yes. Don't try to reason with them from here first. Always begin here. It's a very important principle. Because it's the love of God that draws them unto himself. So this afternoon, I'm not going to spend all the time with this, but I just want you, you to read this last, this, this one. Read, read it with me, everybody. Let's read together. I hope I have everything here right. Let's read it. They have been wounded what? Emotion. So that's your context. That's the context. That's the, that's the context that you are dealing with. You are dealing, we, are, we are focusing this afternoon on the former members, people who have left the church. And this is the context. This is the particular condition in which they find themselves. Okay? So the church needs to organize so that they can come to fellowship and, and there's a worship and celebration once again. Luke 15. So that it is the point. So, But today I want to... I want to not go in just the theory of it, I want to go down to the practice of it because we don't have much time and I want to make sure you have the principles. So I want to focus now, here is the main part of my presentation, I want to focus on the process, the process of reclaiming missing members, okay? The process of reclaiming missing members. The process begins with a divine call. Every member of the church or the persons who, go, who are going to participate in this ministry of reclaiming the former members, you must receive a divine call from God. This divine call is a conviction that God has called you to this ministry. Not every member in the church will be able to participate in that ministry. It has to be a call from God. You have to sense that conviction from God that he calls you to this ministry of ministry of regret. Reconciliation, Ministry of Reclamation, reclaiming former members to the church. Unique call. The call refers to a conviction that, Lord, this is what you want me to do. When you have that conviction, the, the church leaders, the pastor, must extend a call, a call to the members who would like to participate in this ministry. You recruit them, you select them for the particular ministry. And... Um, you recruit persons, the persons who you recruit are persons who have a good report inside the church and outside the church. I want to say that, very important, the persons who are going to be involved in this ministry. Persons who have a good report inside the church and outside the church. Persons who have good human relationship skills. Isn't, that's important. 
and persons who have a sense of spiritual discernment and filled with the Holy Spirit. You say, well, Pastor, how can I detect those things? How can I detect those things? God will show you. Don't you worry. But it is important that because this ministry is really a ministry engaging in spiritual warfare. Are you with me? Yeah. So it is important that those persons are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Those persons have sense of spiritual discernment so that when they walk into a particular situation, they can know what to do and what to say at the right time. And most importantly, they must have a good report inside the church and outside of the church. The persons you recruit. Then after you have recruited them, you must provide them with training. I'm showing you the process. Provide them with training. How should you, what should you train them with? You should train them how to, how to, um, make contact with people with missing members you should train them in human relationship skills you should train them in um, in um, how to ask questions but the most important thing I want you to train them in is how to listen how to what listen. how to listen listening is a very important skill when you're doing ministry to reclaiming missing members so in the training you will show them how to listen to missing members and I will demonstrate that to you also then you also need to show them how to identify. Identifying, what is identifying? Identifying is no matter how long a member have left the church, he's always a brother or sister. Yes. So that when you, whenever you, you make contact with him, you always address him as, good afternoon, brother Joan, good afternoon, sister Joan. It's always a brother, sister, whether they have left the church for 20 years, 30 years, once you're making contact with them in a way to reclaim them to Christ, you address them as brothers and sisters. Identifying is very important. Then there's contacting. Contacting is how you will approach them. I'm going to demonstrate that to you to show you in a while. I'm just guiding you through the process. How, you, when you, how, you, how do you contact them when you get to the home? What do you say? How do you address them? And that's the contacting. Then listening is important. And I will illustrate it. Then empathy. How do you empathize with them? When they're speaking, how do you empathize with them? Empathize is, is by saying, wow. He says to you, I want to have nothing to do with Adventists, a bunch of wicked people. <laughs> wow. Ooh. <laughs> Pastor. I don't want to see that pastor. That pastor is the devil. You say, wow, wow, wow. Mm. See, that is empathizing. It's how you how you empathize. And I will demonstrate that to you to show you. I'm just wanting to see. Then acknowledging. Acknowledging is when you when when he says when he when he says when he says, um, I don't want to have anything to do with, with Seven day Adventists. You you can simply say, Wow, I understand how you feel. It's identifying, is acknowledging the feelings. When, you, when you're speaking to former members, you do not listen to what they say. You listen to the feelings behind what they say. Are you hearing me? You're not listening to words. Don't listen to the words. Listen to the feeling behind the words. And you reflect back the feeling to them. So that in that way, you're connecting with them. You're showing them that you understand how they feel. So I'll, I'll show you why. Then apologizing. Apologizing is acknowledging that... Um, that the decisions made or the things said about the person, the, 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 acknowledging that the feelings that the person have is as a result of the actions that the church may have said or the things that members have, have said. So that's acknowledging. Assuring, where, assuring is where you assure them that you still love them and they're still part of the family of God. Testing is where you give them an opportunity, you may give them a book or something to test if they have if they accept what you have just said to them. And praying and anticipating is where you invite them to church once again. And um, hosting, before you can invite them to church, you need to prepare the church. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. You need to prepare the church that these on this day, all of these members are going to be coming to church on a special homecoming Sabbath. So you prepare the church. All members who have problems with, you know, you, you, I will show you how to do that. You, you, you prepare the church. Then you have the homecoming Sabbath. Okay. Then there's the reconciliation and then there, there's the um, integrating of the new, of the former members into the family of God. Okay. So, can you give me the other? Can you give me the other slide? Give me the other. Um, the new slide. The, the, the next presentation. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, lovely. Thank you. No, 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 no. That's, is that it? No, no. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, that's it. I want you to write this down and then I'm going to demonstrate it and make it practical for you. Everything I've just said, don't you, if you didn't write it down, don't you worry. I'm going to make it live so you can see it and feel it and do it, okay? But first, you take these steps. When you engage in informal members, the first thing to do, address them when you, that's when you're approaching, when you get into the house, okay? You get into the house, you're now beginning the ministry, you have received the training, you begin. The first thing to do is to address them as brothers and sisters. Good afternoon, Brother Joan. Good afternoon, Sister Joan. Or never say Mr. or Miss or brother or sister, okay? Then identify with the feelings of infirmities. Identify with the hurts, with the bruises, what they're saying, the, the negative things they're saying about, about the pastor, about the church, identify with that. Then be quick to listen. That's come from James here. Yeah? Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Be, what is it? Be quick to listen and slow to speak. So you listen more, especially in your first visit. Do a lot of listening. Don't, 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 don't speak too much. Just listen a lot and slow, and slow to speak. Then look at that. Do not defend the church or defend the pastor or defend the man members. Don't defend anybody. If they, say, if they say the pastor is a wicked man, don't try to defend him. If they say, oh, a bunch of hypocrites, don't defend. If they say, um, you know that first elder, that first elder, that man should never be in church. Don't defend nobody. Don't defend. Why, why should you not defend? Okay, let me show you. Look, let, let me show you why not, why not defend. A former member is like a bottle of water. Okay? In, in the bottle is a lot of anger and bitterness and hurt and bruises. Okay? So don't defend. If you, 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 the reason why you are listening, the reason why you are listening is to allow the bitterness and the anger to be poured out. So you're listening. Yeah, uh -huh, wow. Ooh, I feel the, oh, this is terrible. Ooh. <laughs> You identify, you are allowing the water to be outpoured, okay? The anger to be outpoured so that you do all the listening. So let them do the speaking, you let them do the speaking, let them pour all the anger, all the anger. But if you defend, then you are blocking the anger from coming out. Are you with me? If you begin to say, no, my pastor is a good man. No, the brother never said that. You are defending. So you're, you're blocking the anger from flowing out. So don't defend. Don't defend. Simple, listen to the negative emotions that are coming behind the words. Don't defend. I know you sometimes, we Adventists, we like to defend. But don't defend. It's not a time to defend. Just simple, listen. Do not defend the pastor. Do not defend the member. And so forth. Empathize with such words. You empathize. As they're pouring out the negative, you empathize with such words. I feel the pain. I hear the, I hear the cry. Oh, this is awful. Wow. Terrible. I didn't know. I have discovered, I'm, I'm married for 33 years now. Listen, I have discovered, it took me 33 years to discover the power of listening. <laughs> you know ladies like to talk a lot. Ladies talk about everything and anything. And sometimes I would just brush it off as not important and so forth. But after 33 years, I discovered the best way, the best secret is to listen. So my wife, when I go home, she would tell me all kinds of things, all kinds of stories. I say, wow, mm, terrible, wow, this is terrible, man. And she would just talk and talk and talk. And then in, in 15 minutes, she's normal and everything is nice and she's happy. Very important. Now listen, man, listen, man. I have discovered that ladies are always right. 99% they're always right. Yeah. No, you can trust your wife. 99% they're right. They have special gifts. I was telling the president today that on every committee you should have 30% 30, 30, 30, 30 of the people on the committee should be women. Because women bring a particular mindset of skill set to decision making that men do not have. You know, sometimes we, we see the quick point, we see the big picture, but the lady sees the details and, and she sees danger. When, when we cannot see any danger, the lady sees the danger. Are you with me? That's why you go to, go to have men. I, I'm suggesting to your recommendation, listen to your wives. Even though you think they're not right. Even though you think... Oh, and I wasn't, I wasn't speaking to you, I was speaking to him. <laughs> yeah. 
listening is very, very important. And it's in, in, when, you're, when you're dealing with the ministry of former members, it's important to listen. So you empathize with their, their grief and so forth. Even Jesus, Bible, in, in, when in, in Hebrews, empathize. Apologize on behalf of the church in this way. Brother, Sister Joan, I apologize for this terrible pain we have caused you. We have done foolishly. I am ashamed. Say, read that with me, everybody. Okay, you don't you don't apologize like this. Don't say, Brother John, we have, we apologize for the pain that we have caused you. We have done foolishly. I am ashamed. No, your apology is not like that. Don't raise your voice like this, Brother John. We apologize for the pain that we have caused you. We have done foolishly. I am ashamed. I am ashamed, Brother Joe. We apologize. Now, when, when, you apologize, when do you apologize? You apologize after you have given him plenty of time to pour out the anger. Are you with me? Yeah. You wait. You don't. You time it. You wait for all the anger to flow. You time it. You listen. It may take you one visit, two visits, but you wait for all the anger to be poured out. And when you think he has sufficiently poured out all of the anger, then you come with the apology. Now, when you give the apology, sometimes they will say, I don't accept the apology. You mean you apologize? Why you should be apologizing? He should apologize. Then they tell you about this person that should apologize. But you, you, don't, you don't, don't divert, don't take the bait. Don't take the bait. Simply say, stick like a broken record. Brother Joan, we apologize. We have done foolishly. No, it's not you, not you, it's the pastor. Don't, don't, don't take the bait. Brother Joan, we apologize. We have done foolishly. We are sorry. If she says, if she says, if she says, I want to speak to that elder, that elder who did me that thing. Brother Joan, we apologize. And we're sincerely sorry. However, however, you should go privately and talk to Brother, Brother Harry and say, Brother Harry, I spoke with Sister Joan today and, and this is what she said. She'd like you to, to come and apologize to, to her. Now, what do you do? You work with Brother Joan and you give him special fear therapy, okay? Yes. Special counsel and you show him how to approach. Yes. And so you arrange, in, not in the church, not at his home, but you arrange in a neutral place where both of them can be. And you, you counsel your brother first what to do. Yes. So that when he comes, he's not going to defend anything. He's not going to say, you, you did this. No, he's not defend. He's simply coming straight to the point. Brother Joan, I want to let you know today, that's the person, okay? I want to let you know today that I sincerely apologize for the pain and the grief and the discomfort I have caused you and your family. He comes straight to the point. After he, when he gives that apology, you wait for the response from the other person. If the other person did not accept the apology but he begins to pour more anger upon him, you train him up to simple listen. Don't defend. Don't go back to past history. Don't review past cases. Just simple listen. Let him pour out. Because you after reconciliation, let him pour out. And then he repeats again, Brother John, we sincerely apologize. And by then, you would come to a recon po a point of healing. Then you pray. The prayer, this prayer, is very important. Before you pray, you say, I want to, I we want to do better. I assure you that I consider you to be our brother and sister. So you assure him that you consider him to be brothers and sister. And we do miss you at Sabbath school. I brought you this new Bible study guide. So you bring him a Bible study guide or, 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 or quarterly or, or, or any booklet you want. You, say, I, you, you give him the booklet to test, to see his level of acceptance and reconciliation. So you're testing him, all right? Uh, anybody have a book here? Brilliant. OK, lovely. So, Brother Joan, I brought you this beautiful Bible study guide, so you're, you're testing him to see if he will accept it. He said, no, I don't want to accept it. You simply say, Brother Joan, I, I want to show you that we still love you. And we look forward to the day when you will fellowship with us. No, do not invite him to church next Sabbath. No, don't invite him because you have a homecoming Sabbath that is uh, six months in advance. Are you with me? 
So don't, simply say to him, Brother John, I look forward to you fellowshiping with us one of these days. But don't tell him when. And then you pray with him. The prayer is very important. In the prayer, do not confess the sins of Brother John. <laughs> don't begin like that. Oh God, you know Brother John. You know the sins that he has caused and the pain that he has caused us. No, you would have lost him. So don't mention anything about the sins of Brother Joe. Here is how the prayer goes. Dear God, we are thankful for Brother Joe today. Oh God, forgive us for, us for the pain that we have caused him. We are sorry, oh God, for the pain and the heartache we have caused to Brother Joan. Please forgive us. Yeah, who you're praying about? Us. And then you move quickly from that confession to say, God, bless Brother Joe. Bless his home. Bless his wife. Bless his family. And Lord, we look forward to him fellowshiping with us one of these days. Amen. <coughs> Very powerful prayer. And that's the time Brother John is listening to you. So I want to demonstrate that to you quickly, those points. What I just did with you, I want to demonstrate that. So I'm going to pick somebody. Okay, I'm going to pick somebody. So Elda, I want you to come. Again? Okay. <laughs> I, I just pick it at random. You come, yeah? Yeah, please. I'm going to demonstrate, watch this, okay? He's a former member. I know. Because you know Come on, baby. Look at this. He has left the church. It's 10 years now he has not been to church. The members, no, he's a former member. Yes. 10 years now he has not left, come visit the church, come to church. Why? The members said a number of things about him. One, they said that he stole church money. <laughs> two, two, they said that he got a sister in the church pregnant. Three, they said that he beat his wife. Four, they said that, that he, he carried gossip for the pastor. Okay? So they said lots of things about him, and they, he left the church. How do you think he would feel about those things? How do you think he would feel about those things? Huh? He would be angry. He would be hurt. He would be bitter. Okay? So you can see why he, he has left the church. He's emotionally disturbed, but doctrinally still sound. Are you with me? But he's disturbed. We're here. Not here. Here, okay? So I'm going to visit him. Ten years he has not come to church. So you, you remember I have not visited you for, you have not come to church for ten years and visited you for the first time. So let's look at what is going to happen, okay? Watch this. Watch the demonstration. Who's that? Good afternoon, Brother John. Oh, Pastor, is that you? Brother John, we want to let you know today that we, Pastor, we still I love you. I said it before and I'm going to say it again. I don't want to have anything to do with you people, you know? Wow. What you people said about me? Wow. I don't want to have anything to do with you people. I'm sorry. Can you close the door behind you, please? Brother Joan, I want to assure you today that we still love you, and that's why I'm here today. Love? Does the love express the way they done to me? Wow. I understand how you feel, Brother yes. John. I'm really cut up. Ooh. I tell you something. Mm. I've never hated before. Mm. And I've never hated like this. Oh, mm. <laughs> you feel very. You, 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 huh? Pastor, the more I'm seeing you, is the more I'm getting hated. I'm hating you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I cannot entertain you at this moment. Uh, Brother John, we want to assure you that we still love you. Ooh, we still here, and that's why I'm here today. And why did you people treat me like that, Brother Joan? Don't you think I have feelings just like you too? You said I stole. You said other things about me that I'm ashamed to speak about. <laughs> Oh, wow. This is terrible. This is terrible. Pastor, I didn't take that money. <coughs> Nothing goes like that. Wow. 
Brother John, I want to let you know, Brother John, that we apologize. We are sorry, Brother John, for the pain that we have caused to you. We apologize. I am ashamed. I am embarrassed for the pain that we have caused to you. Brother John, I want to let you know that we are sincerely sorry. Sincerely sorry. You know, you let me start to think now. You know, Pastor, I did say you should go. But I listened to what you have to say. But John, I want to show you that we still love you. And to show you that we still love you, I have brought you. <laughs> Brother John, to show you that we still love you, I have brought you this Bible study guide. In your spare time, you may read it occasionally. Brother John, I, 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 I brought you this so you may read it in your spare time. It's to show you, Brother John, that we still love you. And we look forward to fellowshipping with you, Brother John, one of these days. One of these days. Now, Brother John, before I go, would you prefer me to pray for you in the kitchen or would you prefer me to pray for you in the dining room? Pastor, I do accept your apology. But I think I myself have to apologize. I did take that money. <laughs> I'm sorry. Brother Joan, would you prefer me to pray for you in the kitchen or would you prefer me to pray in the dining room? Pastor, not only here, but you see, while you go through the door, continue to pray for me. So would you prefer me to pray for you in the kitchen or in the dining room? <laughs> Okay, let's pray. Oh God, we are sorry for the pain and the grief that we have caused to Brother Joan. Oh God, please forgive us and help us to do better. We pray today, dear Lord, that you would bless Brother Joan, bless his wife, bless his children, bless the work of his hands, that whatever Brother Joan does, Lord, would bring forth bountifully. Pray for your divine protection over him. And dear Lord, we look forward to the day, one of these days, when he will fellowship with us once again. Grant him the power of your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Brother Joan, God bless you, and you leave immediately. Do not stop to eat um, um, ackee and saltfish, bread, fruit, or dumpling. No, you leave immediately. Amen? Yes. Do not have any other conversation. You leave immediately after the visit. Now watch something. Watch something. Sometimes, and, and you see, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. And as you, as you engage him, as, as you listen to him, and you allow him to outpour all of the anger, and the Holy Spirit, he says to me, Pastor, indeed, I did steal that money. I never listened to that. That I'm not going to take that bait. I simply continue. Would you prefer me to pray for you in the kitchen or in the dining room? Now, when I prayed, I never, con I never mentioned his sins. I would not mention that. I am asking God to bless him. Because you, you keep your goal in mind. Your goal is reconciliation. Are you with me? So it's important to listen. Because when you visit the member for the first time, he's going to pour all of the anger. And you are tempted to try to defend. You're, trying, you're tempted to open the Bible and try to correct. No, that's not the time for that. Your key work is to listen and to allow the anger. Allow the anger to be poured out. No matter how bitter it is, let it, just, let it be poured out. And you would gauge the Holy Spirit would guide you. That's why I said there are people who must be filled with the Holy Spirit. You will, you will gauge when he has reached to a place of, of healing. And then you come to with a sincere apology. A sincere apology. 
Sometimes they do not accept the apology immediately, but don't be distracted. Keep focused. Brother John, we sincerely apologize. And the prayer is important. You can pray for him anyway, but if I say, would, would you, if I say, let us pray, he might say no. So I don't I say that, let us pray. I simply say, Brother John, would you prefer me to pray for you in the kitchen or in the dining room? On the road or in the bathroom? You, you understand? I've given him two choices. And you can make the choices, any two choices. Anyone he chooses, he's still, you're still going to pray. Are you with me? That's the point. But if you give him one, he can say no. But if you give him two, then he has a choice. He's not bottled in. He has the freedom to, to select. The prayer is your key. Once you get him to pray, when you don't tell him, let us kneel, you simply, when you, say, he's, when you say, would you prefer me to pray for you in the kitchen or in the dining room, he says, in the kitchen, you, you simply do this. Non-verbal. No, don't tell him, let us pray, let us kneel. Don't say, you, 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 you begin to move towards kneeling and he, he follows your non-verbal. Are you with me? Yeah. And you kneel. And when, you, when you're kneeling, if it's a man and you're a man, you place your hands upon him. If it's a lady, don't put your hand. And you pray. And your prayer must be soft, soft tone of voice, move quickly to the point where, Lord, dear God, we are sorry for the pain that we have caused to Brother Joe. Oh, God, please forgive us. You're putting the onus on, on the church. Please, yeah, brilliant like Nehemiah. Both I and my father's house have sinned. And then, Daniel, and then you, then you move to the point of asking God to bless him. By that time, by that time, Brother John is usually in tears. Or the family in tears, or the wife in tears. And when you get up from the prayer, leave immediately. Why should you leave immediately? If you stay and eat, you will lose him. Because you become familiar with him or her. You leave immediately and leave the Holy Spirit to continue the work that you have begun. Amen? And then you'll have another visit. Okay. So turn to the person next to you and discuss, discuss the demonstration. And just what, what, did, what went well in the illustration and what could you have done differently? Discuss in groups of two what went well in the illustration I've just given and what could you have done differently? Discuss it in groups of twos. Clarification? Question? Yes. This particular reconciliation, Elder, cannot be done on social media. This has to be person. person to person. You know, you cannot do that on social media because you have to be able to see the person. You have to be able to hear the person or pour in the anger out, you know? Except your, your counselor and a special gifted for that, but I, for, for the congregation, I would not recommend the social media. You try to find the person where he is and Church. Yes, yes. I've, I've, I've heard. Yes, I know. And I've, I've heard where people have poured out their, their uh, issues on social media. Yeah. And um, we don't know how to deal with it. Yes, because, because you, you're poured out on, on social media, but you cannot give the feedback. You cannot give the personal touch. You cannot bring them to the point where you pray for them immediately. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? So, yeah. Social media probably is not the place for that, you know, because you never know who is listening and who is watching and who is hearing and where it will go. Okay? So, yeah. Okay. So, let, let me, let, watch this. You had another question? Okay. Look at this. I'm going to review this again and I'm going to do one more demonstration to make sure it stay with you. Okay? What, what is the first point you should do? What is the first thing you should do? Address the brother. Let me hear you, everybody. Okay, two. What's your, what's the next one? Which, which is the, the negative emotions? And ne what's the other important one? Okay, you do a lot of listen. Next one. Don't be defensive or defend the church or its members. Okay, its members. That should be its members. So empathize with such words as say those words with me. Uh huh. Uh huh. 
that, does that remind you of Jesus in Exodus chapter 13 or there about where Jesus I heard your cry, I feel your pain. He connects with your emotions, he identifies with the feelings. That's very important to do that. Okay. Um, then we go ahead with you. You apologize on behalf of the church in this way. Brother, Sister Jones, I apologize for the terrible pain we have. No, even though the church, listen to this, even though the church made the right decision about disciplining the member, it's a right decision, but the right decision has caused pain. So you're not apologizing for the decision, but you're apologizing for the pain the decision has caused. Is that okay? Yes. Are you with me? Yes. So we apologize for the pain. Yeah, good. So let's go. We want, we want to do better. I assure you that I consider you, we consider you uh, to our brother, our sister. We do miss you at Sabbath school, and I have brought you a Bible study guide. We look forward to you um, fellowshipping us one of these days. Okay, I'm going to take a lady now. I'm going to take a, choose a lady for illustration. So we had a man and I'm going to choose a lady. Okay? James. Sister, can I choose you? So. Okay. A lady will give us a different mix. Alright? So let's let's look at this. I'm not very good at this. Let's, let's see how well she will go. I'm just picking her on the spot, so, so let's listen now. Everybody, attention. So she has left the church for 20 years now. She, um, um, because for many reasons, people said negative things, you know, all kinds of things about her, and said that she, you know, this, uh, no, and she had left the church. Okay, right. So I'm coming to visit you for the first time after 20 years. Uh, you, nobody really came to visit you, and after 20 years, you're seeing me for the first time, okay? I'm coming to visit you, so you will, you will begin to respond to that. Let's go. Good afternoon, Sister Joan. My name is Samuel, and I'm just here to assure you, Sister Joan, that we still love you. After one who do to me down there, me now come back down the pastor. Mm. Them there's something they want to do to me. Wow. People talk, ah, oh, that's something about me. Me never know something. What, 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 excellent, brilliant, very good, very good. Watch, watch, watch my head. <laughs> wow. You see my head? Watch my head. You see? Wow. Mm. Pastor. Mm -hmm. Me never do them something from me. Mm. I may never hear about them as something that's a tell me coming to church. Me now come back to church, Pastor. Mm. Me now come back. So. I don't know what to tell you said today, Pastor. I don't no, no think that I come back. So if I that you come to me, but it's not bad. Sister Joan, I want to assure you that we still love you. Yes, they still love me, but they wouldn't say there's something about me if they still love me. Nobody, they, nobody, nobody shouldn't talk like that about anyone. Wow. Mm. So please, Pastor. This is terrible. Please, Pastor. <laughs> me think me I go to a different church. <laughs> because, because this is not right. You shouldn't be talking to me. People shouldn't be talking about other people like that. You say, no, sister and brother. No. This is terrible, no, Sister Jones. Mm. Mm. Sister Joan, we want to assure you that we still love you. Still love me, Pastor. I'm going to tell you, say, when we come to the church, and we go to sister, the sister, and we talk something about the sister, to the sister. The sister go back and scatter it as, as put it in a different context. Ooh. And, and he never said them there's something the way she had on. Oh, this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> so, Pastor, can I offer you something to drink? Sister Joan, I want to assure you that we still love you. Sister Joan, I want to let you know today that we sincerely apologize for the pain, for the grief, for the sorrow we have caused you. We apologize. I am embarrassed. I am ashamed for the kind of grief that we have caused you. I'm your sister pastor. Are you sister of a church? Are she sister? And so, and so Sister Joan, this is why we apologize. But Pastor, I know you free apologize because you didn't say anything. You're a nice man, Pastor. Mm. So you never said something. Then. What about your sister in a church? 
without them something about me. It's on behalf of the and sister. On behalf of the sister. We apologize. Then I should come back at church and then what, what, what will happen afterwards? Sister Joan, here's what we will do. Okay. I may arrange for a special occasion for you can speak with Sister Harry. You know, I will be there myself and we will speak with Sister Harry and to let her know exactly that, to let her also share with you her sincere apology for the things that she has said. I, I, I don't know, Pastor, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know. Yes, I... I don't know, because... I do not want you to make a decision now. I'm just saying that we, we, would, we will arrange that if it is convenient. But today, we want to assure you that we sincerely apologize. We are sorry for the pain that we have caused. She should apologize. She should apologize. I understand that. She should apologize. That's, I understand. I understand. I understand. Sister Joan, today, we want to assure you that we still love you. And so we have brought for you a beautiful Bible study guide that you may read in your occasion, in your spare time when it's convenient to you. Pastor, a lot of time I want to come to church, but I can't come back to church after all them something they pass. Yes, I understand. I feel the pain. I feel the sorrow. But I want Thank to give... Thank you, Pastor, but I don't know, Pastor. I don't know if I can come back. Yes. I don't know. Sister, Sister Joan... I, I will think about it, Pastor. I will, I will read this and I will think about it, but I'm not so sure about it. I understand, Sister Joan, I understand. This is my first visit. And we look forward to you one of these days, whenever, one of these days, that you will fellowship with us because we want to show you that we still love you. Sister Joan, would, can, I pray, can I pray for you in the kitchen or, or, in, or in the dining room? Pastor, I don't know, Pastor. I don't know, Pastor. Um, I don't know. I don't know, Pastor. Yeah, would you prefer the kitchen or would you prefer the dining room? Pastor, me say, me hurt, you know, Pastor, me hurt. Mm -hmm. Me hurt down there, you know, Pastor, mm -hmm. me hurt mm -hmm. very bad. Yes, I, 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 I feel the pain. I feel so, the pain. So, Pastor, let me ask you something now. They're supposed to come back at church. Where are going to help? Sister Joan, we look forward to you one of these days, but today I want to pray for you. Would you prefer me to pray for you in the kitchen or in the dining room? Okay, sir. Anywhere. Anywhere. <laughs> Father, we, Father, today, we are sorry for the pain that we have caused to Sister Joan. Please forgive us and teach us how to do better and to love her and to care for her. We pray that you would bless her abundantly. Bless the children, bless her husband, Protect the children, O oh Lord, as they go to school each day. And I pray that you would keep their marriage and keep them faithful to each other. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, would you like something to, to drink, Pastor, or a cup of tea or something? Sister Joan, I appreciate your kindness, but I want to assure you this will not be my first, last visit. Okay, God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Lovely. You yeah. This work is a, is a wonderful work. Amen? Yeah. Brothers and sisters, listen to the man of God. If you really want to live long, engage in this ministry. This ministry brings satisfaction. This ministry, you can see the devil at work in, the, in, in its fullest. You have to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. You have to be focused because you see many times, you see how she tried to draw me into things many, yeah, yeah. many times. Many times she tried to pull me in different directions, but I'm not going to take that pain. I keep focused. She, I ask her, Sister, would you prefer me to pray for you in the dining room or in the kitchen? She wants to draw me into a direction. She wants to draw me. So you, you must keep focus, keep focus. Otherwise, you can get into a long conversation that is not necessary and lose your focus. Your, your focus is to help reconcile that person first onto Christ and, and secondly onto the church. Won't you say amen? You follow the principles I've given to you here. I've given you many demonstrations, but this is the ministry. I want you, you need to identify all the missing members of this church. Identify who, where they are. The church clerk, the church clerk, the, the Sabbath school secretary, these persons have the records. Now after you have identified them, 
you need to provide training for a group of persons who are going to engage in this ministry. Also, you need to set a specific day for the homecoming, and the homecoming should be set one month in advance. Example, you can say next year, the first Sabbath of September will be the homecoming for this church. So you have one year to prepare all the missing members. You are making contact with them, you're building a relationship with them, you are, and, you, and you're preparing them for the homecoming Sabbath. And a very important thing, I want to close with this, you need to train the church. You need to prepare the church for this. Because you do not want, when all the home, all the missing members return to church on that Sabbath, the brother said, well, watch this wicked woman. <laughs> you remember? You, no, you don't want that. Or you have members, you want members when they sit there. Or they come and they sit. No, you have to tr prepare the members and let them know all who the people who are coming, how to respond to them, how to treat them. The sermon must be specially selected. The pastor must preach or your elder and the sermon must be on the love of God. Won't you say amen? amen. I suggest that the Sabbath school not be taught in Sabbath school classes because sometimes you put, you put that person to teach in a Sabbath school class with one of the members who have done them something wrong and the, the Sabbath school teacher takes the opportunity to... Uh -huh. No, you put, you, you arrange it in a way that the Sabbath school class be taught on a whole by one of your best teachers so that will bring healing and it's focusing on the love of God and he knows how to guide the lesson study. So this is very important. Now, if you should provide luncheon for all the missing members and everybody should eat together and if there are members, if there are members when they return, when the missing members come, there are members in the church with whom they had conflict. You should train those members when the when the missing members arrive to be able to go to them and say to them, Brother Joan, Sister Joan, I am sorry for the pain that we have caused. I have caused you. I am sincerely sorry. You train them not to end, go back into past history. It was simply to make the apology and leave it at that with no further explanation. All right? And so you, you prepare the church for that very important homecoming Sabbath. And then you reintegrate them back into the church. Now, it takes one year for this process to be completed. How long does it take? One year. So on your first visit, do not invite them to church. You'll have a second visit and a third visit and so forth. Any questions? What if, what if they turn up to church? What if they decide to come to okay. If, 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 they, if they turn up to church by themselves, if they turn up to church by themselves, you welcome them. You don't say that I didn't expect you. No? No, you, you, you shouldn't have surely accept them. But you do not deliberately extend an invitation to them you, because you don't want to box them in. You want to give them latitude. Yes. Missing members must be given a little bit of freedom. Don't yes. box them into yes. anything. Yes. Make them feel free. So yes. if they turn up, accept them, yeah. welcome them. Okay, lovely. in for them to apologize what if they then refuse to apologize to the member that they wronged how do you handle that okay if 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 they if they refuse if they refuse yeah. <laughs> you you want you want me to show you how to do it <laughs> would you give me five minutes to illustrate it yes. Yes. five minutes yes. five okay let me illustrate pa pastor Pini, please, please. Please come. I mean, you're not going to do anything. You don't have to say anything or do anything. I'm just going to illustrate something. Very important. How do you do this? You, that's when you're preparing the church. So you, you inoculate the church up front. You remember Paul, how he inoculated new disciples? So look at this. As, as we go, as we get ready, go to your Bibles quickly to look to, to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. I want you to prepare you for, the, for what I'm going to show you. How to, how to prepare the member and how to bring healing. Okay? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Okay? You found it? Yes. Okay. Let's read it together. And be kind one to another. As forgiven you. Read it again, everybody. Okay, look at this. I'm going to illustrate it. Sister, 
Please stop. Elder, come. Look at this. And then stand in the middle. Right? Just stand here. Elder, stand over here. So look at the illustration. I'm illustrating the text. God, <clears throat> the member, neighbor. Okay? So what, who are the people? Okay, lovely. So this is the neighbor. She's a member. She's a teacher. She's also a banker. She's a very wealthy lady. She's married. She has nine children. Okay. She decides to go on a vacation to, to Spain. So she left England and she went to Spain on a vacation. And her neighbor knew that she left. And she went to Spain. Her husband also went to another country. And she, she left. And the children were at school, at the university, because they're grown-up children. And he broke into her house while she was in Spain. He stole her television, a computer, and he found where she had 10,000 pounds hidden underneath the mattress. In the back of the mattress, deep in the mattress. He found it. I don't know how he found it. So he, he stole the television, he stole the, the, the computer, and he, he, he stole the 10,000 pounds. When she returned from, 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 from Spain, she discovered the house was broken into her television, her TV, and so the things were stolen. How do you think she would feel? How would she feel? She would be angry. And then she discovered he's the one who did it. How would she feel towards him? You know, bitter, isn't it? Bitter, angry. But while she was in Spain, while she was in Spain, she, she, she happened to find an ex-boyfriend. And although she left her husband back home, she met her ex-boyfriend in Spain, and she got herself tangled up with strange fire in Spain. And then she came to a meeting like this, and she heard of the importance of forgiveness. It's an evangelistic meeting and the pastor makes a call to, to repent and to be baptized and she decides you know Lord I need you to forgive me for what I've done in Spain so she turns to God no she turns to God and she confesses to God and God lifts his hands up and he forgives her amen, amen. does she deserve the forgiveness yes. does she deserve it yes. she does not deserve it no. but but God gives it to us a free gift of Grace, are you, are you grateful for the forgiveness? Yes. yes, she is grateful for the forgiveness that God has given to her. Now, God has forgiven her, so she is reconciled with God, so she reconciles. I know she doesn't hold the hands of people, you know, so I know she, she tells me she doesn't hold people's hands. Okay, okay, so God has forgiven her, so she is reconciled to God. Now, now, she looks at the brother here who stole her money and stole her stuff. But because God has forgiven her and she has received forgiveness from God, are you thankful? Yes, she's thankful. And now, because God has forgiven her, she's extending that same forgiveness she received from God. She's extending it to him. And she says, brother, Mr. John, Mr. Harry, God has forgiven me. And because God has forgiven me, I am extending forgiveness to you. I know you're the one who did it, but I am forgiving you because God has forgiven me. And he's so shocked by this. He didn't expect it. Overwhelmed with the goodness of God because the Bible says the goodness of God leads to repentance. He turns and says, God, you know I'm the one who stole the lady's goods, stole her money. Oh God, please forgive me. And he asks God, and God forgives him. You know, so he's reconciled with God. She's reconciled with God. 
see, she's reconciled with God. And if he's reconciled to God, she is reconciled to God, and she is reconciled to him. Are you with me? Yes. No, why did she forgive him? Why, no, why did she forgive him? Before God, because God forgave her. And in the whole process of this healing, he himself returns the money to the lady. Returns the television, returns the computer, returns everything. I give you this illustration to show you. Before the homecoming Sabbath, you have to do an illustration like this to show the members why, why they should forgive. When the, when the new members come, when the, when the former members return to why they should forgive each other? Why should they say this? Because God has forgiven you. And because God has forgiven you, you extend forgiveness freely, won't you say amen? amen. I mean, I do this all the time. When I do prayer conferences around the world and I do this illustration, I mean, the whole church is broken. And on the Sunday morning, the church is packed to capacity. People come in. And when we do the reconciliation, you should see what is happening. People all over in tears and what have you. But I just pull this here to illustrate your point, sister. This is what you, should, you need to do. The kind of education, the kind of illustration you need to give so that members can understand the biblical rationale and see the line why they should forgive. Did I answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, my friends. Thank you. Yeah, we'll take one more question. Any more questions? One more. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sisters. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Member, not a member. Was doing Bible study, and they decided to baptize. But members in the church, in the church, um, discourage them by saying things and things like that, and they refuse now. They stop coming. Husband stop coming as well. Not interested anymore because of what happened. How should we handle that? When, when the person was not yet baptized, you know. No, but they decide to baptize. And yeah. Bible study, decide, choose songs, everything. Yes. So, so here is here is what here is what they follow the same principle of where you you go to the brother and you let him know that we are delighted that, and God is delighted for the decision he's contemplating to be baptized, okay? You let him know that and tell him we look forward to the day when he will be baptized, and then when you when you say that to him, he will begin to pour out to you all the reasons. All the reasons why he cannot be baptized. Your job there is to listen. Don't defend. Don't try to correct. But just let him pour it out. Everything you you listen. Yes, I feel the pain. Yes, wow, this is terrible. You let him pour it out. It may take you two visits, three, but let him pour all of the visit, all of the anger, all of the, the hurts he had. And after he has done that, then you 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 bring up, you come, and you you make a sincere apology on behalf of the church. We are sorry. For what we have done we are brother john we are sorry for interfering with the great decision the holy spirit has given to you we sincerely apologize and then you give him a book to test whether he's accepting your the apology of the church and then you you say to him brother john i look forward to inviting you to fellowship with us one of these days i look forward one of these days don't tell him when one of these days to continue the bible study with him and you're gonna follow up visit and you but but the point that is here the problem with him is not here the problem is here okay so what you have to do is give him an opportunity give them an opportunity to pour out the anger by listening to them for one or two days just let, let them pour it out and then you'll bring the healing that's how to approach it thank you but good this good 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 point yes it's a one more yes oh why why would it take you um 10 or five years to go and visit the individual when they have been going through that Problems during the problem, during the time of the problem with the person, somebody should have come or to see that person doing that time to comfort the person to talk to the person. Why would it take you so long to go to that individual? Yes, but that's a great point, sister. And this is some of the deficiency we have in the church. There are people who have left the church, and some members we have never visited them for five years, two years, three years, four years, and you know and so forth. But I, the, the point is, this is where the Sabbath school plays a critical role. The Sabbath school needs to recognize her role. She's a community of grace. Once a person is missing, you should visit them the next day, the next, uh, and so forth and so forth. But, but the point is, right now we have a lot of missing members all over the world, and we need to reclaim them. And so this is the approach we're recommending to begin uh, uh, reclaiming the ministry, all the missing members in our congregations. Okay? So, um, yes, sister. Okay, 
well, this, this is now dealing with the active members, okay? The active members, the pastors should visit the elders, everybody should visit the active members. Uh, yes, sister, I agree with that. This is an important um, part to, to play, I agree. Especially in, in, this, in, this, in this kind of pluralistic society, sometimes the pastor doesn't have the opportunity or find it very difficult to visit, but we should return to the old tradition of visiting our members. But I, I want to focus the presentation on those who are really missing the pastor should also play a role on that in reclaiming those former members. Yes, but great point, great point. Yeah, we take one more person and we close. Hi, Pastor. Um, knowing that you are in prayer ministry and I'm very, you know, passionate about prayer ministry, how do you, you know, when you have a program like this where you can't do it in the flesh, you know, what sort of prayer program would you sort of plan? to go with all of this, you know, because when you're going out into people's home, I think those recruiters, are, you know, should be, you know, have gone through some process of praying fast and etc. Very good point. This is a great point I want to end. This is a spiritual work. As I said before, it is a gift. It's an initiative of God. He gives us the ministry of reconciliation. He gives us what to say, the message. It is there, what to say. And, um, I'm suggesting, I'm suggesting that the Sabbath school, the Sabbath school organized a ministry of prayer, like, like half an hour before Sabbath school, there's a, spirit, a, a group of intercessors along with those who are going to do this ministry, where you meet for prayer, okay? And you pray together, praying for the people. Here's the key thing in the prayer, ask God to give us access to the hearts of the former members. You heard that, you heard that word? Yeah. What do you ask God? God, give us access to the hearts of the former member and you will be surprised to see when the former members knock at the door how the holy spirit because there will be two forces when you when you knock at the door there are two forces satan will be there to cause them to resist you okay but you're going in the power of the holy spirit and you're going with the idea that god is going to give you access so when you say good afternoon and they begin to pour out all the negatives behind you don't be afraid stand in the power of god amen, amen? Stand in the power of God until you bring them to the point of reconciliation. So, prayer ministry, sister, is the key. So, this church, who is going to conduct this, you should have a strong prayer ministry. The person chosen, as I said, must be people filled with the Holy Spirit. People who have a good report inside and outside the church. Because if you send a person to do a reconciliation with a member, a former member, and that former member knows something about that person, it cannot be done. So, the person you send must have a good report. Won't you say amen? Good report inside and outside the church. But I want to say to you, this church must become one of the leading churches in, 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 in this new ministry that the, the union has of reclaiming thousands of missing members. And I say to you, if you engage seriously in this ministry, your new church that you are building, I just saw it, is going to be one of the best buildings in the whole of London when it's finished, your church will become too small. Amen? And um, I'm, writing the, I'm writing this book here, I'm going to, I'm writing this book right now, I'm writing it in detail and everything I'm going to translate into Spanish, French, and English. And when I complete it, I will send you a copy, amen? amen. So you'll have all the detail and everything there with it, so you can, you can do this one. So I want to pray for you before I close, but probably before I close, I would turn over to Pastor and, and the others so that they can have the closing. But let's pray first. Father, we thank you for this training we have received today. We thank you for the leaders of this church and the pastor and for the initiative they have taken. Help them to know that this is anchored in the words of Jesus. Go to the lost sheep of Israel first. So that as we focus on the lost sheep of Israel, we will find encouragement to focus on the active members, the new members, and those who have not yet known Jesus. We dedicate the leaders of this program to you. Grant them the power of the Holy Spirit. Help them to know there are hundreds of missing members, former members, who are out there languishing without God and without hope, wondering where is the church they once loved. Many of them are young people, Lord, who have left the church, who have got tangled up with the things of this world, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. There are many mothers here today, their hearts are aching for the children who are out in our cities without hope, without the assurance of salvation. Oh God, 
awaken this church, awaken the leadership, the elders, the pastors, everyone, to take this ministry seriously, to put it the first thing on the church board agenda, and to ensure that members are selected for this ministry. May this church become a leading church in the reconciliation of missing members. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.